Amen. Thank you, ladies. That was, I know if I've said it once, I've said it <clears throat> at least a hundred times, but I hate to interrupt <laughs> worship, especially on Wednesday nights. It's just, it is so good. I feel like, man, as good as it is, there ain't no reason for me to interrupt it with anything I got to say, right? So, uh, it is, it's beautiful. That, um, tonight, I guess, <laughs> if you want to say, in a way, take two, right? So, um, but we are going to be in James chapter two again. So, um, I want to read this and then we'll pray and we'll get started. So, uh, he, he, James starts out, he says, My brethren, do not hold your faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ with an attitude of personal favoritism. For if a man comes into your assembly with a gold ring and dressed in fine clothes, and there also comes in a poor man in dirty clothes, and you pay special attention to the one who is wearing the fine clothes and say, you sit in a good place. And you say to the poor man, you stand over there or sit down by my footstool. Have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil motives? Listen, my beloved brethren. Did not God choose the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor man. Is it not the rich who oppress you and personally drag you into court? Do they not blasphemy, blaspheme the fair name by which you have been called? So if, however, you are fulfilling the royal law according to scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You are doing well. But if you show partiality, you are committing sin and, have con and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles in one point, he has become guilty of all. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not commit murder. Now if you do not commit adultery, but do commit murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. So speak and so act as those who are to be judged by the law of liberty, for judgment will be merciless to one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Heavenly Father, Lord, we ask your blessing upon this message tonight. Lord, that you would um, speak through me, Lord, the words that you would have me to say. Lord, that I wouldn't speak a word of my own, but only those of yours. And Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit would be our teacher tonight, that you would illuminate the scriptures to each one of us, Lord, that we might apply it to our lives to become more like your son, Jesus Christ, and to be perfect as our Father in heaven is perfect. Lord, we thank you for the, this passage. Lord, we thank you for everyone who's here tonight. And in your son's name we pray. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So. Now, I want, to, I want to kind of backtrack just a little bit because, remember, James has just got done saying pure and defiled religion in the sight of God at the end of chapter 1. And, and Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself un, uh, unstained by the world. So he just got done telling us. He said, you want to know what your perfect religion looks like? This is what I want you to do. Visit the widows and orphans in their distress. Why, you know, if you can boil it down to one external, one external act, right? Because one's external and one's internal. To go out and visit the widows and orphans is an external act, and to keep yourself untainted by the world is an internal. That's something you do internally. So it, why, why is it visit the widows and orphans is the one external thing that, that James goes to? Now, and he, and he's going he's gonna to elaborate on this, but I think it has to do with the fact that he's saying, listen, the, those that are least among you, the most vulnerable, the ones that have, and I think part of that is the ones that have the least ability to pay you back for what you're doing. So that you have no other motive, you, you have no selfish motive in going helping widows and orphans. Because they can't pay you back, right? So the only reason you would do it is out of an unselfish desire to serve Christ. So those that are least among you, right? This is how you do it. And to keep yourself untainted. So James is going um, to expound upon this. Now, um, 
th there's some way that, that, that rabbis would teach at this time, right? Um, and they would call it a string of pearls. And, and they would say something, you kind of see this in Proverbs, right? We talked a lot about how James takes after Proverbs. So they'll, they'll talk a little bit and then they'll talk about something else and then they'll pick back up again on what they were talking about before. And they talk about something else and then they go back and pick up on this thing. And, and you'll see James do this is he keeps going back and picking up on this idea of, of caring for the poor and how you treat the poor, right? And, and as we'll talk about, it's not necessarily about the poor per se, it's just how you treat the least and the most vulnerable among you. That is part of your religion, right? Um, so this is where James picks this up, right? He starts out when he says, my brethren. Now, I like this when he says, my brethren. Because <laughs> James is going to accuse them of something that they are doing, right? They're treating people in a wrong way. Um, but he reminds them before he kind of slaps him up alongside the head. He says, now my brother, and he says, listen, I love you guys, right? But you need to listen and stop doing what you're doing. Because this is what it says, what it says, do not hold your faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ with an attitude of personal favoritism. This is an imperative that he's telling him. He's saying, you guys, the way he says this, he's like, stop doing what you're doing. Right? That's one of the good things about the Greek language is that sometimes the verbs give us little hints of stuff. That he, He's not talking about a hypothetical situation. He's talking about an action that is currently taking place. He says, you need to stop that. Right? He says, do not hold your faith. Now, I, I think it takes us just a moment to um, look at, just briefly, how faith is looked at in the New Testament. And I think it's, it's kind of divided into two, to two bits. So the first part is like our personal relationship or our personal belief in Christ is our faith, right? Um, if you think about when, in Matthew, when the, Jesus is teaching in the house and it's so crowded and the, the people come with the man on the stretcher, on the, the paralytic on the bed, right? And they can't get into the house because the place is packed. So they, they rip open the roof and they lower him down. And it says Jesus looked up and he saw their faith. Okay, so in that, in that sense, he, he sees how much their desire to be with him, their desire to, and their belief in him, right? He sees their faith. Now, in other places... Um, like um, uh, in, in Acts when, uh, I was trying to think of a good example, right? Um, in Acts, when Paul is going out after they have had the, their, their counsel about whether the Gentiles should be circumcised or not, and Paul leaves and he goes out and he finds Timothy. And we always think it's funny because the first thing he does after uh, Timothy joins him is he circumcises Timothy, right? Just after they had this whole thing saying the, <laughs> the Greeks don't have to get circumcised, but he does it. Anyway, another sermon for another time. Um, but then he says, but then he, says he, he carries these decrees to the churches and their faith is built and, and, strength, and, the, and many people are getting saved. So in that sense, what faith means there is like your doctrines, the, the, the intellectual things that you give assent to, right? That's, that's your faith. Um, the faith that was once and for all handed down from the apostles, right? Um, I can't hand you my faith, right? In the sense of my own personal faith, I can't give that to anybody else. I can't give that to my children. But we can grow in our faith, right? I can instruct you in the faith. I can instruct my children in the faith. Right? Okay, so does that make sense how the, the, they view it two different ways? Okay? Now here, so how is James using it here, and why does it matter? Right? James is using this in the personal way. Not in your set of doctrines by which you're living with, with, right? I do this, I don't do this. He's talking about your personal belief and your personal relationship with Christ. He's saying, don't hold, don't say that you have faith in the glorious Lord Jesus Christ and then have an attitude of favoritism. You can't, you can't do that, right? You, see, you guys need to stop that because that's what you're doing. They, he was, whoever he's writing this to at this time, this is what they were doing. They were playing favorites. And, and some of this carries over, we'll talk about it a little bit. Some of this carries over from the way they did things in the synagogue. In the synagogue, if, if you were a rich and important man, then you got special treatment. 
They, they viewed that as if you were a rich and powerful person, then they would say, oh, well, he's favored by God. So they would look, they would say, oh, come sit up here. Come sit close to us because we want you to be around us, right? But if you came into the synagogue and you were poor or despised, then, then you, you stayed in the back because the rich were given a place up front. So remember in the early church, and if we go along with it, that James was one of the earliest books written, right? James is dealing with some of this carryover from the synagogue, from the, old, from the, from the way the synagogue operated before to now the way Christ wants it to operate. So he's dealing with something different. But I also think that it's interesting that, that um, James calls him our glorious Lord Jesus Christ, right? And, and some of your translations may, see, uh, may say um, Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, right? Um, and I think about this. Remember, this is James's, James is Jesus' half-brother. And what would it take for you to say that your half-brother, the, the, the one you grew up with, right, that he is the Lord of glory. And that, that he's equating him. Now, James, in no uncertain terms, is equating him to God the Father himself. This is the point that James is making. Look, Christ and the Father are one and the same. The Lord of glory is God the Father, is Yahweh, right? Is, is Elohim, he's, is all, he, he, that is who he is. He's saying, Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, right? He's giving him a divine title. <laughs> what would it take for you to say that your brother is the Lord of glory? Nothing short of the resurrection. Because James isn't mentioned before as, as one of Jesus' disciples. If anything else, he's one of them that comes and gets him and says, you've been out in the sun too long, brother. You need to come back, right? You're beside yourself. And, 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 and I think about this, too, and this is where I, I want to go to uh, 1 Corinthians 15, right? If you want to turn there, we'll put it up on the screen. Um, Paul takes note of this, and I think it's very important, right? And, we, and I, I, forgive me if I've talked about this before, but I think this is a very, is how all this stuff goes together, right? Um, and, and Paul is talking about how he's one of the apostles, right? But he mentions James in this passage. So he starts in, in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 3. He says, For I handed down to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, who is Peter. He, first he appeared to Peter, and then to the twelve. And after that, he appeared to more than 500 brothers and sisters at one time, most of whom remain until now, but some have fallen asleep or some have died. And then he appeared to James. And then to all the apostles. And last of all, to one untimely born, he appeared to me also. So, <laughs> you know what I think? And, and I don't know, obviously, the conversation that took place, right? But you see James go from... Jesus' skeptical half-brother to the leader, for all, for all purposes, the leader of the church in Jerusalem. Because when they, can't, when they when need a judgment, this is who they go to. Should we have the Gentiles be circumcised or not? Who do they go to? Who makes the judgment? James does. So and think about this, right? This is, not, forgive me a little rabbit trail, okay? I won't charge you for this part. Remember who these 12 knuckleheads are, right? These are the guys who are fighting about who's going to be, who's going to take over when Jesus, when you leave. So who's in charge, right? So you got these 12 guys who have been doing this, and then all of a sudden James is going to show up and be in charge? I think what I, just give me a little liberty if you would, right? I think Jesus went, when he went to the 12, he told them, listen, I'm going to go see James. James is going to believe, okay? And I want him, I, I got a job for him to do. I think Jesus told him. Because then after that, then he goes and talks to James. He has a special meeting with James. He says, James, here's the deal, I got a job for you. And you see James take this, this uh, position of prominence in the church. So I don't think it's merely conjecture. You know, James had a special, whatever it was, it seems as though he had a special one-on-one -on -one meeting with Jesus after the resurrection. 
So now you have James going, you know, and Jude might have been there too. I don't know. He, you know, he might have been like, ah, oh, but this is what it took, right? This is what it took. And James, in no uncertain terms after this, is like, yep, Lord of glory. And so many times our first meeting with Jesus is the same. We go from a sinner to a redeemed person, and we're like in no uncertain terms. Is this man the Lord of my life, the Lord and Savior of my life? So James is us, right? We're just we're say we have this. So James, so for all that, right, now James comes up and he tells people, like, listen, you guys not knock off what you're doing. And having an attitude of personal favoritism. Because we know that, you know, God is no respecter of men. He has no favorites. Look, even Mary acknowledged she needed a savior. You know, not even... I, <laughs> this is why, we, you know, the Catholics want to lift Mary up as this. You know, I, and for, the, for the longest time, I thought the Immaculate Conception talked about Jesus, right? It doesn't. It talks about Mary. That Mary was immaculately conceived. Are you kidding me? That's, <laughs> Mary recognized she needed a savior. She doesn't, she doesn't even get a special place, right? So then um, James continues and he, he gives them this hypothetical situation, right? He says, for if a man comes into your assembly with gold ring and dressed in fine clothes and there's also comes a poor man in dirty clothes, you pay, pay special attention to the one who is wearing the fine clothes. You say, sit here in a good place. And you say to the poor man, you stand over there and sit down by my footstool. Have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil motives? So he says, he says, let's hypothetical situation, right? That two people come into your meeting. What a rich man, all decked out, fine clothes and rings. And, 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 but that ring isn't necessarily just the one ring, right? He's talking about a, a, a gold ringed man. Because that's part of what, how, what the status symbol was the more gold rings you had on your fingers than the, the higher um, status you had. Because they actually had places in society there where you could go rent rings for special occasions. So that when you went, you could put on this big pomp and circumstance that you're somebody important because of look at all this. And how many people do that today, right? Everybody's trying to keep up with the Joneses, trying to put on airs that, you, you know, that you're somebody who may be more than you really are. They did the same thing then. And he said, but this guy comes into your meeting and you say, oh, hey, good to see you. Come on up front here. Can I get you something? Do you got any questions? You, you know, you treat him this way. And then the dirty poor man comes in and you say, let's just go, go stand over there. You kind of, you kind of, yeah, just, we, we got somebody important up here. We don't want, we don't want him to see you, right? And he says, you can't. You can't do this. And he says, don't you, don't you think you've made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil motives? So you, what, what you're doing is you're making distinctions where maybe God hasn't. And you're treating people differently. Now, when there isn't, the, there isn't a, um, and I, I think, right, well, this, and it isn't even so much that this rich man is a believer, because James says later on, isn't, doesn't he even blaspheme the name of Christ? So they're not even taking into account the spiritual aspects of the thing. They just want to be, they just want to be close to the rich guy. They just want to be close to the, somebody who could do something for them, right? Maybe he'll give me a little something. Maybe he can... Send the big tithe checks or whatever it is, right? You treat him differently than you treat the one who can't do anything for you. Now, um, in, in this, and there's one thing about this, right, that I want to make a, a distinction to here. He's not, he's not saying that the poor man is poor or more righteous simply because he's poor. Right? The, both the, the rich and the poor man still have to get saved. They still have to come to Jesus. 
right? They still both got to repent. And, and, you know, they'd say it's easier for, you know, it's easier for the uh, camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to get in heaven, right? Being rich has all kinds of its own obstacles because you could so easily just forget about God if you can get whatever you want. You have nothing to, re you, you don't need anything from anybody, right? And so many, most of the early Christians, the vast majority of them were poor. Part of it was that they didn't have anybody else to rely upon, right? You had to go to God for your daily bread because every day you had trying to squeak out an existence. But just because you're poor doesn't mean that you're automatically righteous either. Because poor people can also excuse some of their behaviors because they're already done without things. They're being denied something. They, you know, for example, like, oh, well, I have to steal to feed my family. Right? You, you can excuse certain behaviors because you feel like you're missing out on something else. So the poor also have their own things to come overcome. Um, you know, as Tavia said, Reptavia says, you know, there's nothing wrong with being poor, but, you know, if being rich is a curse from God, may God smite me with it, right? You know, he does that whole thing, but um, I don't know. I just thought about that. I love that movie. But <laughs> if being rich is a curse from God, may he smite me with it. But, um, you know, so, so just because you're poor doesn't mean that you're righteous either. But this isn't the point that, that this isn't the point that James is really trying to make also. He's just saying it, it's not so much that you treat the rich man well, it's that you treat the poor man so poorly. You mistreat the poor man. If you treated them both the same, if you treated them both great, there's nothing wrong with that. Right? But so it's not that you're just so much that you're giving a special place to the rich man, it's the fact that you're treating the rich man so well and you're mistreating the poor man. So he's saying you, you treat some well, you mistreat others. That's the point he's trying to make. He says, listen, verse 5, my beloved brother. And again, he goes back, right? <laughs> he says, because listen is an imperative. He says, now listen up. My brother, and I love you, right? Did not God choose the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs in the kingdom which he promised to those who love him? So it made me think of, um, on the Sermon on the Mount, you know, Jesus says, blessed are the poor in spirit, so sh because they shall inherit the kingdom of heaven. Well, what is it about the poor in spirit? What does it mean to be poor in spirit? It means those that have no trust in themselves to get to heaven. They have nothing in themselves that they look to and say, God's got to let me into heaven because look at all the great, the great person that I am. Look at all the great things that I do. The poor in spirit are the ones that say, oh, there's nothing good in me. Those are the ones that will inherit the kingdom of heaven. And says, while the people James is writing to hold their faith in favoritism, the poor in spirit are the ones that hold their faith in Christ alone. Verse 6, but you have dishonored the poor man. It is not the rich who oppress you and personally drag you into court. And he's saying, why do you dishonor the poor man? He's like, the, the rich ones are the ones that mistreat you. Because at that point, there was, the rich ones were the only ones that could afford to take people to court. And the other thing that they could do is if they had lend you money and you were in debt to them, they could, and they saw you on the street and you couldn't pay them back, well, they could grab you. And it, says, it actually says the ones that drag you means that they, to grab somebody by the neck and to drag them into court and have them thrown into prison for the debt that they owe, right? They're the ones that are mistreating you. And you think of this as the, the rich servant who, or the, the, the servant who had a great debt and he goes before the king, right? And he forgives him the debt. And what's the first thing he does when he leaves there? He's forgiven this great debt he could never pay back and he sees somebody owes him a few bucks and he grabs him by the neck and drags him back in. And what does the, what does the king say? You wicked, wicked servant. You've been forgiven more than you could ever even begin to pay back. But then you hold these little pittances against other people. Do they not blaspheme the fair name by which you have been called? 
And not, on top of it all, not only do they mistreat you, they're blasphemers. I mean, this is why I say he's not even talking about rich people in church. I mean, these are people that may come in to the congregation, right? But it doesn't mean that they're all saved. And, he's, and even though he blasphemies, he takes everybody to court, you still want to treat him like he's somebody special and treat the poor poorly. If, however, you are fulfilling the royal law according to Scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You are doing well. Now, again, he goes back to this this if, right? He says, I, it's almost like he's saying, now assume, now if, if we assume that you are fulfilling the royal law, then you're doing well. Well, what's the royal law? This is again him making this tie back to Jesus, right? Remember when Jesus was asked, what's the greatest commandment? He says, to love your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your strength. And then right after that, right, I love this, right? They ask Jesus, what's the, what's the greatest commandment singular? And he gives them that one and he says, but the second is like it. To love your neighbor as yourself. And when he says the second is like it, what he's saying is that they're similar, right? You can't separate the two. Yeah, love your God. But also love your neighbor. And he says upon this too, is one of my great, favorite passages, upon this depends all the law and the prophets. <laughs> all the law and the prophets, all the prophecies, everything that was given to Moses and the law, everything that was given to Israel, what does it all hang on? It all hangs on love your God and love your neighbor. Two very simple things. When we talk about the tabernacle, what does it all hang on? It all hangs on a framework. Without the framework, the whole thing comes down, right? There's nothing to support it. What's the framework of God's law? Love God and love your neighbor. He said, let's, let's assume you do love your neighbor, then you do good. But this is the law of God. He's tying it to Jesus being royalty to the king. And G James reminds him, if you do love God, then they will love people without partiality. Now, if you think about this in context, right, to the culture of the day, this is a radical departure from the cultural norms of first century Israel. I mean, and, and it's not just the fact that, I mean, Roman, you, you, you see it when Jesus goes to talk to the centurion, and the centurion says, listen, I, I'm not even, you can't even come to my house. Well, that's a big deal for a Roman to say, no, you Jew, you're not even allowed to come into my house, right? I mean, he, was, he wouldn't have said that. So he's recognizing Jesus' lordship in that. But there's all kinds of stuff, even in, even in Jesus' own disciples, right? You think about it, um, uh, I'm trying to, I, I can't remember. Um, oh, I think maybe I do have it on my next page. Let's go here. Luke 9, right? I, I thought maybe I was going to give the passage for it, just so you don't take my word for it, right? But Luke 9. Remember when Jesus is going down to Jerusalem and the disciples go on ahead of him and they go into Samaria and um, nobody will have them. They say, you know, you're not going to stay here. And so the, the, the disciples are incensed. How dare they not let you come into their, into their house, right? Um, and what does James and John say? They say, Lord, do you want us to call down fire upon these people? Right? Even, even Jesus' own disciples are getting ready to burn the Samaritans. Hey, this is where they get their names, right? The, the sons of thunder. <laughs> I mean, Jesus is even dealing with this in his own group. These guys can't stand other people. And Jesus says, do you not know what kind of spirit you are of? For the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. Right, so even in his own 12, he's dealing with bigotry and people that don't want anything to do with other people. There was separation in the synagogues between men and women. There were separations between free and slave. But God, Jesus comes along, and God changes all of that. Paul says in Galatians 3, 27 and 28, For all of you who were baptized into Christ have closed yourselves with Christ. There is, no, there is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free man. There is neither male nor female. You are all one in Christ. So listen, you guys, there's no distinction in the kingdom. 
Nobody's better than anybody else. Are there still roles? Is there still a position? Yeah, of course. But, but as far as who's worth more, who should be treated better, who, who has to play by different rules, he says, listen, we're done with all of that. No more. So for then James to come along and the first one to go, listen, you guys quit treating people with partiality. Everybody's the same. And you call it, I mean, people talk about Jesus being, oh, he's such a revolutionary and all this stuff. No, see, God had this planned out all along, and this is the rules they should have been playing by. But James has to come along and smack him up on the head and say, would you guys knock it off, quit treating people differently? The law of God says love your neighbor. But if you show partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. Listen, if you're doing this, you're sinning. You're a bunch of sinners, and you will be judged by the law. Who's a transgressor? A transgressor is somebody who knows what the law is and says, you know, now nah, I'm not going to do that. I want to do my own thing. Listen, there's no salvation in transgression. You can't transgress the law, know that you're stepping out of bounds, and then go, yeah, but I'm saved. Can't do it. And, and, there, and so in the next couple of verses, this is very important because this understands how the law works. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles in one point, he has become guilty of all. For he who said, do not commit mur adultery, also said, do not commit murder. Now, if you do not commit adultery, but do not commit, mur but do commit murder, sorry, my dyslexia is kicking, I guess, tonight. Um, you have become a transgressor of the law. So how does this work, right? And, and, and there is so much of the church that doesn't get this. Doesn't get this, right? So what's James saying? James saying, listen, look, if you break even just the smallest part of the law, you are a law breaker, okay? Now, he's not saying that if you, if you commit adultery, you're the same thing as a murderer, right? That's not what he's saying. Right? It's not that if you break one commandment, then it's as if you break you. You also have other gods. You make graven images. You uh, you bear false witness. Like that's not what he's saying. You didn't you didn't go down and become a murderer and all these other things, right? He's saying you've broken the whole of the law. So if a good analogy, the way I've heard it is, if you think of the law as a as a pane of glass, and you throw a rock through it, you were a lawbreaker. You broke the law. Okay, you break the whole thing. It's not that you break the whole thing. You've broken the law, right? So it, there's other ones that then they'll say, well, they, they use stuff like this and say, well, see, all sin is the same, right? No, no, not all sin is the same, right? Um, just because you, you know, if I, if I lust after another woman in sin, it, it's not, I'm not committing murder, that, that's not the same as committing murder, okay? There's not, um, you know, having, stealing a piece of bubble gum is not uh, the same as putting up a, an idol in my home and having my family worship this idol, right? Um, you know, I've had many conversations with friends of mine, and they'll be like, well, you know, all, all sin is sin, right? All sin is sin, and it all carries the same penalty, death. Now, but the... the the, the judgment against that penalty, right? The sentencing piece of it, right? If you think of your own law court, right? If you go to court and you're doing 56 and a 55, you get a little fine. If you're doing 105 and a 55, you're gonna get a bigger fine, right? Even our own justice system is, the, the, the punishment is commensurate with the crime. It's the same way with God. Okay, when he judges sin, right, yes, all sin will send you to hell. The only thing that will come out of sin is death, right? But when it comes to the punishment of those sins, it, it says that the one that um, Jesus tells a parable, Jesus himself says, he tells a parable, he says, you know, if there's servants in the master's house, and the one that knows what he's supposed to do and doesn't do it, he says on the day of judgment, the stripes that he receives are worse than everybody else. He'll be punished worse because he knew what he was supposed to do and he didn't do it. He's going to get a worse punishment. Now, the one that didn't know 
right? And they still broke the law, but they didn't know that they broke that part of the law. They're still guilty, right? You're still guilty, but you're not as bad as the one that knew what he was supposed to do and broke it anyway. Does that make sense, right? So if you break a law, if you break a law, you're a lawbreaker. But that doesn't mean that you're guilty of everything in the law, right? It, the sins are different. Sins, sins will be punished differently. Not all sins are the same. Somebody that deals with alcoholism and struggles with that is not the same as an abortion doctor, okay? They're, they're, not, they're not morally the same. And people will take this and say, look, see, he says it's all the same. You do that. No, that's not at all what James is saying. But what's James' antidote to this? He says, so speak and so act as those who are to be judged by the law of liberty. Like, and I love, we'll get to this piece of it. So what is, and this is really the major theme of James' entire letter, right? Let your words and your actions match those of how a Christian should act and speak. So much of what he talks about, faith and works, and this, you know, what you say. And James is going to talk a lot about the tongue, right? And, what, and how hard it is to manage your tongue. And why is it? Because out of what? Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks, right? I'm still shocked at the things I say sometimes. I mean, I'll say, I still say stuff, and I'm just like, where did that even come from? What that? I know, I'll say ouch too. What do they say? If you can't say amen, you got to say ouch, right? Because it's still stuff. And, and what is it? Like you don't even realize it's there until you say it. And you're like, where in the world did that come from? Because we still got work to do. Right? But this is what James is saying. He says, so speak and so act as those who are to be judged by the law of liberty. And I... The law of liberty. I love this. This is something, I don't know, it's really been meaning a lot to me lately. The law of liberty. What's the law of liberty? It means that you are under a law now that sets you free to do things. We, so many times, especially when you're first saved, I know I've talked about this before too, but bear with me. right? We, we always People won't come to Christ because they're worried about the things they're going to have to give up. Right? I'm not going to be able to go out drinking the way I used to be. I'm not going to be able to do this. I'm not going to be able to, you know, I'm going to have to give up sleeping around. I'm going to have to give up doing this stuff. If I go, oh, man, I'm going to lose my friends. All these things that you have to give up. Well, that's not the way the law of liberty works. You're not put under bondage. You're delivered from bondage. You're set free. Well, what are you free to do? Well, first, you're able to, you're set free to love the Son. You're set free to serve the Father. You're set free from sin. You now have liberty to live your life the way that you got intended from the very beginning. You're set free. You have the liberty to stop those sinful behaviors. You're set free from being addicted to drugs. You're set free from having to go get drunk. You're set free to love your wife in the sacrificial way that you're supposed to. You're set free to, love your, to honor your husband even though he's that big knucklehead we all know he is, right? I can admit that because Anna walked out the back for a moment, okay? So <laughs> I just won't let her watch the replay. You know what? You're free to lead your paths. You lead your family in paths of righteousness. You're free to go to work and to give that pain-in-the-neck boss the day's work that you're supposed to give him. And you're free to tell those sinner friends that you were afraid you were going to lose. You're free to tell them now that they need to be saved. That they need Jesus. See, Jesus does not put us under bondage. We don't become slaves to the law. We've been set free. You're free to live your life the way God wanted you to live your life. The way man was supposed to live his life from the garden. That's the law of liberty. 
We're, uh, we're saved under the law of liberty. So it's not, out, it's not about what you give up for Christ. It's about what Christ sets you free to do. James continues, for judgment will be merciless to one who has shown no mercy. His mercy triumphs over judgment. Look, you have two choices, right? Judgment or mercy. If you continue, if you continue in the way of being condemned by the law as a transgressor, then you will receive judgment without mercy. Because of your actions for not showing mercy to others. Why does Jesus say, unless you forgive others, you won't be forgiven? Is it that we have to perform some work, therefore, to earn forgiveness? No, that's not it. What he's saying is, listen, you have to understand how this works. Just as we talked about the slave who was forgiven much and then wants to go after the one that owes him just a little bit. Listen, we've been, given, we've been forgiven more than we could ever even imagine. Right? I don't even think we understand. The, I, don't, I really don't even think we're capable in our mortal bodies of understanding the enormity of the sin that, that we were born under. Like, I, don't, I don't think we can understand because... Because in order, to, in order to fully comprehend how great our sin is, you would have to fully comprehend how great God is. You can't do that. We're not capable of understanding how great our transgression is. So then you're not even really fully able to understand how much you've been forgiven. A debt you could never begin to pay back. But yet we want to go back and hold other little things against other people. So what we do is we tell God, no, no, my hurt is worth more than your hurt, God. What that person did to me is worth more and hurts more so I can hold on to it even though you've forgiven me for the great things that I've done to you. My hurt was more. <laughs> no, it doesn't work like that. You can't do that. Your pain is not worth more than God's. Your hurt was not more than, than what? You didn't give up more than God gave up. So you don't get to not forgive somebody else. That's why he says, how do you know if you're going to receive mercy? Show mercy to others. Because you've been forgiven. Understand, you need to forgive them because mercy will triumph over judgment when we die and go to heaven we get raptured we go to heaven we go to the, our judgment time what's the only thing that's going to deliver us from hell mercy mercy but you can't have mercy without judgment you can't be, you, the judge can't be merciful on, on you, ha, can't have mercy on you until you've been sentenced to death. <laughs> the sentence is death. Okay, Lord, <laughs> judge, have mercy. Okay, I'll let you go. The sentence has to be passed first. Judgment has to be, judgment has to be forthcoming. But for those that are in Christ, mercy will triumph over judgment. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for tonight. Lord, I thank you for everyone who's here. Lord, I th thank you for your word. Lord, I pray that we might fully grasp and understand who we are in you. Lord, I pray that we would not play favorites with people. Lord, I pray that we would not be involved in cliques or anything else, Lord, that may detract from your body. Lord, we're all one body. We're all members of the same body. We're all worth the same to you. And Lord, I pray if there's anyone who feels like they're not worthy, not the same, not, they feel as though somehow they don't deserve 
to be part of the body, whatever it might be. Lord, I pray that you would touch them. I pray that you would show them. You don't play favorites. There's no partiality in your body. Lord, everybody is needed. Everybody is worth the same. Everybody is part of the same body and of the same worth, Lord Jesus. Lord, I thank you for tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.